Remember what Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way, in that, I learn of him, and the pathetic part of it is that frequently those who have the least justification for a feeling of achievement, bolster up their egos, by a show of tumult and conceit, which is truly nauseating, as Shakespeare put it, man, proud man dress in a little brief authority plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as, make the angels weep. I am going to tell you how business people in my own courses have applied these principles with remarkable results. Let's take the case of a Connecticut attorney, because of his relatives he prefers not to have his name mentioned. Shortly after joining the course, Mr. R. drove to Long Island with his wife to visit some of her relatives. She left him to chat with an old aunt of hers, and they rushed off by herself to visit some of the younger relatives since he soon had to give a speech professionally on how he applied the principles of appreciation, he thought he would gain some worthwhile experience talking with the elderly lady, so he looked around the house to see what he could honestly admire. This house was built about 1890, wasn't it? He inquired, yes, she replied, that is precisely the year it was built. It reminds me of the house I was born in, he said, it's beautiful, well built, roomy, you know, they don't build houses like this anymore. You're right, the old lady agreed. The young folks nowadays don't care for beautiful homes. All they want is a small apartment, and then they go off gadding about in their automobiles. This is a dream house, she said in a voice vibrating with tender memories. This house was built with love. My husband and I dreamed about it for years before we built it. We didn't have an architect. We planned it all ourselves. She showed Mr. R about the house and he expressed his hearty admiration for the beautiful treasures she had picked up in her travels, and cherished over a lifetime paisley shawls, an old English tea set, Wedgwood china, French beds and chairs, Italian paintings, and silk draperies, that had once hung in a French chateau. After showing Mr. R through the house, she took him out to the garage. There, jacked up on blocks, was a Packard car in mint condition, my husband bought that car for me shortly before he passed on she said softly. I have never ridden in it since his death you appreciate nice things. And I'm going to give this car to you. Why, auntie he said, you overwhelm me. I appreciate your generosity, of course, but I couldn't possibly accept it. I'm not even a relative of yours. I have a new car. And you have many relatives that would like to have that Packard. Relatives, she exclaimed. Yes, I have relatives who are just waiting till I die so they can get that car. But they are not going to get it. If you don't want to give it to them, you can very easily sell it to a second-hand dealer he told her. Sell it. She cried. Do you think I would sell this car? Do you think I could stand to see strangers riding up and down the street in that car that car that my husband bought for me? I wouldn't dream of selling it. I'm going to give it to you. You appreciate beautiful things. He tried to get out of accepting the car, but he couldn't without hurting her feelings. This lady, left all alone in a big house with her paisley shawls, her French antiques, and her memories, was starving for a little recognition. She had once been young and beautiful and sought after. She had once built a house warm with love and had collected things from all over Europe to make it beautiful. Now, in the isolated loneliness of old age, she craved a little human warmth, a little genuine appreciation and no one gave it to her. And when she found it, like a spring in the desert, her gratitude couldn't adequately express itself with anything less than the gift of her cherished Packard. Let's take another case. Donald M. McMahon, who was superintendent of Lewis and Valentine, nurseryman and landscape architects in Rye, New York, related this incident. Shortly after I attended the talk on how to win friends and influence people, I was landscaping the estate of a famous attorney. The owner came out to give me a few instructions about where he wished to plant a mass of rhododendrons and azaleas. I said, Judge, you have a lovely hobby. I've been admiring your beautiful dogs. I understand you win a lot of blue ribbons every year at the show in Madison Square Garden. The effect of this little expression of appreciation was striking. Yes, the judge replied, I do have a lot of fun with my dogs. Would you like to see my kennel? He spent almost an hour showing me his dogs and the prizes they had won. He even brought out their pedigrees and explained about the bloodlines responsible for such beauty and intelligence. Finally, turning to me, he asked, 
Do you have any small children? Yes, I do I replied. I have a son. Well, wouldn't you like a puppy? The judge inquired. Oh, yes, he'd be tickled pink. All right. I'm going to give him one the judge announced. He started to tell me how to feed the puppy. Then he paused. You'll forget it if I tell you. I'll write it out. So the judge went in the house, typed out the pedigree and feeding instructions, and gave me a puppy worth several hundred dollars and one hour and fifteen minutes of his valuable time, largely because I had expressed my honest admiration for his hobby and achievements. George Eastman, of Kodak fame, invented the transparent film that made motion pictures possible, amassed a fortune of a hundred million dollars, and made himself one of the most famous businessmen on earth. Yet in spite of all these tremendous accomplishments, he craved little recognitions even as you and I. To illustrate, when Eastman was building the Eastman School of Music and also Kilburn Hall in Rochester, James Adamson, then president of the Superior Seating Company of New York, wanted to get the order to supply the theater chairs for these buildings. Phoning the architect, Mr. Adamson made an appointment to see Mr. Eastman in Rochester. When Adamson arrived, the architect said, I know you want to get this order, but I can tell you right now that you won't stand a ghost of a show, if you take more than five minutes of George Eastman's time. He is a strict disciplinarian, he is very busy, so tell your story quickly and get out. Adamson was prepared to do just that. When he was ushered into the room he saw Mr. Eastman bending over a pile of papers at his desk. Presently, Mr. Eastman looked up, removed his glasses, and walked toward the architect and Mr. Adamson, saying, Good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? The architect introduced them, and then Mr. Adamson said, while we've been waiting for you, Mr. Eastman, I've been admiring your office. I wouldn't mind working in a room like this myself. I'm in the interior woodworking business, and I never saw a more beautiful office in all my life. George Eastman replied, you remind me of something I had almost forgotten. It is beautiful, isn't it? I enjoyed it a great deal when it was first built. But I come down here now with a lot of other things on my mind, and sometimes don't even see the room for weeks at a time. Adamson walked over and rubbed his hand across a panel. This is English oak, isn't it? A little different texture from Italian oak. Yes, Eastman replied, imported English oak. It was selected for me by a friend who specializes in fine woods. Then Eastman showed him about the room, commenting on the proportions, the coloring, the hand carving and other effects he had helped to plan and execute. While drifting about the room, admiring the woodwork, they paused before a window, and George Eastman, in his modest, soft-spoken way, pointed out some of the institutions through which he was trying to help humanity. The University of Rochester, the General Hospital, the Homeopathic Hospital, the Friendly Home, the Children's Hospital. Mr. Adamson congratulated him warmly on the idealistic way he was using his wealth to alleviate the sufferings of humanity. Presently, George Eastman unlocked a glass case and pulled out the first camera he had ever owned an invention he had bought from an Englishman. Adamson questioned him at length about his early struggles to get started in business, and Mr. Eastman spoke with real feeling about the poverty of his childhood, telling how his widowed mother had kept a boarding house while he clerked in an insurance office. The terror of poverty haunted him day and night, and he resolved to make enough money so that his mother wouldn't have to work, Mr. Adamson drew him out with further questions and listened, absorbed, while he related the story of his experiments with dry photographic plates. He told how he had worked in an office all day, and sometimes experimented all night, taking only brief naps while the chemicals were working, sometimes working and sleeping in his clothes for 72 hours at a stretch. James Adamson had been ushered into Eastman's office at 10.15 and had been warned that he must not take more than five minutes, but an hour had passed, then two hours passed, and they were still talking. Finally, George Eastman turned to Adamson and said, the last time I was in Japan I bought some chairs, brought them home, and put them in my sun porch, but the sun peeled the paint. So I went downtown the other day and bought some paint and painted the chairs myself. Would you like to see what sort of a job I can do painting chairs? All right. Come up to my home and have lunch with me. And I'll show you. 
After lunch Mr. Eastman showed Adamson the chairs he had brought from Japan. They weren't worth more than a few dollars, but George Eastman, now a multimillionaire, was proud of them because he himself had painted them. The order for the seats amounted to $90,000. Who do you suppose got the order James Adamson or one of his competitors? From the time of this story until Mr. Eastman's death, he and James Adamson were close friends. Claude Marais, a restaurant owner in Rouen, France, used this principle and saved his restaurant the loss of a key employee. This woman had been in his employ for five years and was a vital link between M. Marais and his staff of 21 people. He was shocked to receive a registered letter from her advising him of her resignation. M. Marais reported, I was very surprised and, even more, disappointed, because I was under the impression that I had been fair to her and receptive to her needs. Inasmuch as she was a friend as well as an employee, I probably had taken her too much for granted and maybe was even more demanding of her than of other employees. I could not, of course, accept this resignation without some explanation. I took her aside and said, Paulette, you must understand that I cannot accept your resignation. You mean a great deal to me and to this company, and you are as important to the success of this restaurant as I am. I repeated this in front of the entire staff and I invited her to my home and reiterated my confidence in her with my family present. Paulette withdrew her resignation and today I can rely on her as never before. I frequently reinforce this by expressing my appreciation for what she does and showing her how important she is to me and to the restaurant. Talk to people about themselves said this really. One of the shrewdest men who ever ruled the British Empire. Talk to people about themselves and they will listen for hours. Principle 6. Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. In a nutshell, 6 ways to make people like you. Principle 1. Become genuinely interested in other people. Principle 2. Smile. Principle 3. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. Principle 4. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Principle 5. Talk in terms of the other person's interests. Principle 6. Make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Part 3. How to win people to your way of thinking. 10. You can't win an argument. Shortly after the close of World War I, I learned an invaluable lesson one night in London. I was manager at the time for Sir Ross Smith. During the war, Sir Ross had been the Australian ace out in Palestine, and shortly after peace was declared, he astonished the world by flying halfway around it in 30 days. No such feat had ever been attempted before. It created a tremendous sensation. The Australian government awarded him $50,000, the King of England knighted him, and, for a while, he was the most talked about man under the Union Jack. I was attending a banquet one night given in Sir Ross's honor, and during the dinner, the man sitting next to me told a humorous story, which hinged on the quotation there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. The raconteur mentioned that the quotation was from the Bible. He was wrong, I knew that. I knew it positively. There couldn't be the slightest doubt about it. And so, to get a feeling of importance and display my superiority, I appointed myself as an unsolicited and unwelcome committee of one to correct him. He stuck to his guns. What? From Shakespeare. Impossible. Absurd. That quotation was from the Bible. And he knew it. The storyteller was sitting on my right, and Frank Gammond, an old friend of mine, was seated at my left. Mr. Gammond had devoted years to the study of Shakespeare, so the storyteller and I agreed to submit the question to Mr. Gammond. Mr. Gammond listened, kicked me under the table, and then said, Dale, you are wrong. The gentleman is right. It is from the Bible. On our way home that night, I said to Mr. Gammond, Frank, you knew that quotation was from Shakespeare. Yes, of course, he replied, Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 2. But we were guests at a festive occasion, my dear Dale. Why prove to a man he is wrong? Is that going to make him like you? Why not let him save his face? He didn't ask for your opinion. He didn't want it. Why argue with him? Always avoid the acute angle. The man who said that taught me a lesson I'll never forget. I not only had made the storyteller uncomfortable, 
but had put my friend in an embarrassing situation, how much better it would have been had I not become argumentative, it was a sorely needed lesson because I had been an inveterate arguer, during my youth, I had argued with my brother about everything under the Milky Way, when I went to college, I studied logic and argumentation and went in for debating contests, talk about being from Missouri, I was born there, I had to be shown, later I taught debating and argumentation in New York, and once, I am ashamed to admit, I plan to write a book on the subject, since then, I have listened to, engaged in, and watch the effect of thousands of arguments. As a result of all this, I have come to the conclusion that there is only one way under high heaven to get the best of an argument and that is to avoid it. Avoid it as you would avoid rattlesnakes and earthquakes. Nine times out of ten, an argument ends with each of the contestants more firmly convinced than ever that he is absolutely right. You can't win an argument, you can't because if you lose it, you lose it, and if you win it, you lose it. Why? Well, suppose you triumph over the other man and shoot his argument full of holes and prove that he is non-compassmentous, then what? You will feel fine, but what about him? You have made him feel inferior, you have hurt his pride, he will resent your triumph, and a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Years ago Patrick J. O'Hare joined one of my classes, he had had little education, and how he loved a scrap, he had once been a chauffeur, and he came to me because he had been trying, without much success, to sell trucks, a little questioning brought out the fact that he was continually scrapping with and antagonizing the very people he was trying to do business with, if a prospect said anything derogatory about the trucks he was selling, Pat saw red and was right at the customer's throat. Pat won a lot of arguments in those days. As he said to me afterward, I often walked out of an office saying, I told that bird something. Sure I had told him something, but I hadn't sold him anything. And the first problem was not to teach Patrick J. O'Hare to talk. My immediate task was to train him to refrain from talking and to avoid verbal fights. Mr. O'Hare became one of the star salesmen for the White Motor Company in New York. How did he do it? Here is his story in his own words. If I walk into a buyer's office now and he says, what? A white truck. They're no good. I wouldn't take one if you gave it to me. I'm going to buy the Who's It truck I say. The Who's It is a good truck. If you buy the Who's It, you'll never make a mistake. The Who's It's are made by a fine company and sold by good people. He is speechless then. There is no room for an argument. If he says the who's it is best and I say sure it is, he has to stop. He can't keep on all afternoon saying, it's the best when I'm agreeing with him. We then get off the subject of who's it and I begin to talk about the good points of the white truck. There was a time when a remark like his first one would have made me see scarlet and red and orange. I would start arguing against the who's it. And the more I argued against it, the more my prospect argued in favor of it, and the more he argued, the more he sold himself on my competitor's product. As I look back now I wonder how I was ever able to sell anything. I lost years of my life in scrapping and arguing. I keep my mouth shut now. It pays. As wise old Ben Franklin used to say, if you argue and rankle and contradict, you may achieve a victory sometimes, but it will be an empty victory because you will never get your opponent's goodwill. So figure it out for yourself. Which would you rather have an academic, theatrical victory or a person's goodwill? You can seldom have both. The Boston Transcript once printed this bit of significant doggerel. Here lies the body of William J. Dot, who died maintaining his right of way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along, but he's just as dead as if he were wrong. You may be right, dead right as you speed along in your argument, but as far as changing another's mind is concerned, you will probably be just as futile as if you were wrong. Frederick S. Parsons, an income tax consultant, had been disputing and wrangling for an hour with a government tax inspector. An item of $9,000 was at stake. Mr. Parsons claimed that this $9,000 was in reality a bad debt, that it would never be collected, that it ought not to be taxed, bad debt, my eye, retorted the inspector, it must be taxed, this inspector was cold, arrogant and stubborn, 
Mr. Parsons said as he told the story to the class. Reason was wasted, and so were facts the longer we argued, the more stubborn he became, so I decided to avoid argument, change the subject, and give him appreciation. I said, I suppose this is a very petty matter in comparison with the really important and difficult decisions you're required to make. I've made a study of taxation myself, but I've had to get my knowledge from books. You are getting yours from the firing line of experience. I sometime wish I had a job like yours. It would teach me a lot. I meant every word I said. Well, the inspector straightened up in his chair leaned back and talked for a long time about his work, telling me of the clever frauds he had uncovered. His tone gradually became friendly, and presently he was telling me about his children. As he left, he advised me that he would consider my problem further and give me his decision in a few days. He called at my office three days later and informed me that he had decided to leave the tax return exactly as it was filed. This tax inspector was demonstrating one of the most common of human frailties. He wanted a feeling of importance, and as long as Mr. Parsons argued with him, he got his feeling of importance by loudly asserting his authority. But as soon as his importance was admitted and the argument stopped and he was permitted to expand his ego, he became a sympathetic and kindly human being. Buddha said, hatred is never ended by hatred. But by love and a misunderstanding is never ended by an argument, but by tact, diplomacy, conciliation and a sympathetic desire to see the other person's viewpoint. Lincoln once reprimanded a young army officer for indulging in a violent controversy with an associate. No man who is resolved to make the most of himself said Lincoln can spare time for personal contention, still less can he afford to take the consequences, including the vitiation of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield larger things to which you show no more than equal rights, and yield lesser ones though clearly your own. Better give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right. Even killing the dog would not cure the bite. In an article in Bits and Pieces, some suggestions are made on how to keep a disagreement from becoming an argument. Welcome the disagreement. Remember the slogan, when two partners always agree one of them is not necessary. If there is some point you haven't thought about, be thankful if it is brought to your attention. Perhaps this disagreement is your opportunity to be corrected before you make a serious mistake. Distrust your first instinctive impression. Our first natural reaction in a disagreeable situation is to be defensive. Be careful. Keep calm and watch out for your first reaction. It may be you at your worst, not your best. Control your temper. Remember, you can measure the size of a person by what makes him or her angry. Listen first. Give your opponents a chance to talk. Let them finish. Do not resist, defend or debate. This only raises barriers. Try to build bridges of understanding. Don't build higher barriers of misunderstanding. Look for areas of agreement. When you have heard your opponents out, dwell first on the points and areas on which you agree. Be honest, look for areas where you can admit error and say so, apologize for your mistakes. It will help disarm your opponents and reduce defensiveness. Promise to think over your opponents' ideas and study them carefully. And mean it. Your opponents may be right. It is a lot easier at this stage to agree to think about their points than to move rapidly ahead and find yourself in a position where your opponents can say, we tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Thank your opponents sincerely for their interest. Anyone who takes the time to disagree with you is interested in the same things you are. Think of them as people who really want to help you, and you may turn your opponents into friends. Postpone action to give both sides time to think through the problem. Suggest that a new meeting be held later that day or the next day, when all the facts may be brought to bear. In preparation for this meeting, ask yourself some hard questions. Could my opponents be right, partly right? Is there truth or merit in their position or argument? Is my reaction one that will relieve the problem, or will it just relieve any frustration? Will my reaction drive my opponents further away or draw them closer to me? Will my reaction elevate the estimation good people have of me? Will I win or lose? What price will I have to pay if I win? If I am quiet about it, will the disagreement blow over? Is this difficult situation an opportunity for me? Bits and Pieces, published by the Economics Press, Fairfield, New Jersey. Opera tenor Jan Pierce. 
after he was married nearly 50 years, once said, my wife and I made a pact a long time ago, and we've kept it no matter how angry we've grown with each other. When one yells, the other should listen, because when two people yell, there is no communication, just noise and bad vibrations. Principle 1. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. 11. A sure way of making enemies and how to avoid it. When Theodore Roosevelt was in the White House, he confessed that if he could be right 75% of the time, he would reach the highest measure of his expectation. If that was the highest rating that one of the most distinguished men of the 20th century could hope to obtain, what about you and me? If you can be sure of being right only 55% of the time, you can go down to Wall Street and make a million dollars a day. If you can't be sure of being right even 55% of the time, why should you tell other people they are wrong? You can tell people they are wrong by a look or an intonation or a gesture just as eloquently as you can in words and, if you tell them they are wrong, do you make them want to agree with you? Never. For you have struck a direct blow at their intelligence, judgment, pride and self-respect. That will make them want to strike back. But it will never make them want to change their minds. You may then hurl at them all the logic of a Plato or an Immanuel Kant. But you will not alter their opinions, for you have hurt their feelings. Never begin by announcing I am going to prove so and so to you. That's bad. That's tantamount to saying, I'm smarter than you are. I'm going to tell you a thing or two, and make you change your mind. That is a challenge. It arouses opposition and makes the listener want to battle with you before you even start. It is difficult, under even the most benign conditions, to change people's minds. So why make it harder? Why handicap yourself? If you are going to prove anything, don't let anybody know it. Do it so subtly, so adroitly, that no one will feel that you are doing it. This was expressed succinctly by Alexander Pope. Men must be taught as if you taught them not, and things unknown proposed as things forgot. Over 300 years ago Galileo said, you cannot teach a man anything, you can only help him to find it within himself. As Lord Chesterfield said to his son, be wiser than other people if you can, but do not tell them so. Socrates said repeatedly to his followers in Athens, one thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. Well, I can't hope to be any smarter than Socrates, so I have quit telling people they are wrong, and I find that it pays. If a person makes a statement that you think is wrong yes, even that you know is wrong isn't it better to begin by saying, well, now, look, I thought otherwise, but I may be wrong. I frequently am. And if I am wrong, I want to be put right. Let's examine the facts. There's magic, positive magic, in such phrases as, I may be wrong. I frequently am. Let's examine the facts. Nobody in the heavens above or on earth beneath or in the waters under the earth will ever object to your saying, I may be wrong. Let's examine the facts. One of our class members who used this approach in dealing with customers was Harold Ranke, a Dodge dealer in Billings, Montana. He reported that because of the pressures of the automobile business, he was often hard-boiled and callous when dealing with customers' complaints. This caused flared tempers, loss of business and general unpleasantness. He told his class, recognizing that this was getting me nowhere fast, I tried a new tack. I would say something like this, our dealership has made so many mistakes that I am frequently ashamed. We may have erred in your case. Tell me about it. This approach becomes quite disarming, and by the time the customer releases his feelings, he is usually much more reasonable when it comes to settling the matter. In fact, several customers have thanked me for having such an understanding attitude. And two of them have even brought in friends to buy new cars. In this highly competitive market, we need more of this type of customer. And I believe that showing respect for all customers' opinions and treating them diplomatically and courteously will help beat the competition. You will never get into trouble by admitting that you may be wrong. That will stop all argument and inspire your opponent to be just as fair and open and broad-minded as you are. It will make him want to admit that he, too, may be wrong. If you know positively that a person is wrong, and you bluntly tell him or her so, what happens? Let me illustrate. Mr. S., a young New York attorney, 
once argued a rather important case before the United States Supreme Court, List Garden v. Fleet Corporation, 280 U.S. 320. The case involved a considerable sum of money and an important question of law. During the argument, one of the Supreme Court justices said to him, the statute of limitations and admiralty law is six years, is it not? Mr. S. stopped, stared at the justice for a moment, and then said bluntly, Your Honor, there is no statute of limitations and admiralty. A hush fell on the court, said Mr. S., as he related his experience to one of the author's classes, and the temperature in the room seemed to drop to zero, I was right, justice was wrong, and I had told him so, but did that make him friendly, no, I still believe that I had the law on my side, and I know that I spoke better than I ever spoke before, but I didn't persuade, I made the enormous blunder of telling a very learned and famous man, that he was wrong, Few people are logical, most of us are prejudiced and biased, most of us are blighted with preconceived notions, with jealousy, suspicion, fear, envy and pride, and most citizens don't want to change their minds about their religion or their haircut or communism or their favorite movie star. So, if you are inclined to tell people they are wrong, please read the following paragraph every morning before breakfast. It is from James Harvey Robinson's enlightening book The Mind and the Making. We sometimes find ourselves changing our minds without any resistance or heavy emotion, but if we are told we are wrong, we resent the imputation and harden our hearts. We are incredibly heedless in the formation of our beliefs, but find ourselves filled with an illicit passion for them when anyone proposes to rob us of their companionship. It is obviously not the ideas themselves that are dear to us, but our self-esteem, which is threatened the little word my is the most important one in human affairs, and properly to reckon with it, is the beginning of wisdom, it has the same force whether it is my dinner, my dog, and my house, or my father, my country, and my god. We not only resent the imputation that our watch is wrong, or our car shabby, but that our conception of the canals of Mars, of the pronunciation of Epictetus, of the medicinal value of Salicin, or of the date of Sargon I is subject to revision, we like to continue to believe what we have been accustomed to accept as true, and the resentment aroused when doubt is cast upon any of our assumptions, leads us to seek every manner of excuse for clinging to it. The result is that most of our so-called reasoning consists in finding arguments for going on believing as we already do. Carl Rogers, the eminent psychologist, wrote in his book on becoming a person, I have found it of enormous value when I can permit myself to understand the other person. The way in which I have worded this statement may seem strange to you. Is it necessary to permit oneself to understand another? I think it is. Our first reaction to most of the statements, which we hear from other people, is an evaluation or judgment, rather than an understanding of it. When someone expresses some feeling, attitude or belief, our tendency is almost immediately to feel that's right or that's stupid, that's abnormal, that's unreasonable, that's incorrect, that's not nice. Very rarely do we permit ourselves to understand precisely what the meaning of the statement is to the other person. Star. Adapted from Carl R. Rogers, On Becoming a Person, Boston, Houghton Mifflin, 1961, pages 18 ff. I once employed an interior decorator to make some draperies for my home. When the bill arrived, I was dismayed. A few days later, a friend dropped in and looked at the draperies. The price was mentioned, and she exclaimed with a note of triumph, What? That's awful. I am afraid he put one over on you. True. Yes, she had told the truth. But few people like to listen to truths that reflect on their judgment. So, being human, I tried to defend myself. I pointed out that the best is eventually the cheapest, that one can't expect to get quality and artistic taste at bargain basement prices, and so on and on. The next day another friend dropped in, admired the draperies, bubbled over with enthusiasm, and expressed a wish that she could afford such exquisite creations for her home. My reaction was totally different, well, to tell the truth I said, I can't afford them myself, I paid too much, I'm sorry I ordered them. When we are wrong, we may admit it to ourselves, and if we are handled gently and tactfully, 
we may admit it to others and even take pride in our frankness and broad-mindedness, but not if someone else is trying to ram the unpalatable fact down our esophagus. Horace Greeley, the most famous editor in America during the time of the Civil War, disagreed violently with Lincoln's policies. He believed that he could drive Lincoln into agreeing with him by a campaign of argument, ridicule and abuse. He waged this bitter campaign month after month, year after year. In fact, he wrote a brutal, bitter, sarcastic and personal attack on President Lincoln, the night Booth shot him. But did all this bitterness make Lincoln agree with Greeley? Not at all. Ridicule and abuse never do. If you want some excellent suggestions about dealing with people and managing yourself and improving your personality, read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography One of the Most Fascinating Life Stories Ever Written. One of the classics of American literature. Ben Franklin tells how he conquered the iniquitous habit of argument and transformed himself into one of the most able, suave and diplomatic men in American history. One day, when Ben Franklin was a blundering youth, an old Quaker friend took him aside and lashed him with a few stinging truths, something like this, Ben, you are impossible, your opinions have a slap in them for everyone who differs with you, they have become so offensive that nobody cares for them, your friends find they enjoy themselves better when you are not around, you know so much that no man can tell you anything, indeed, no man is going to try, for the effort would lead only to discomfort and hard work. So you are not likely ever to know any more than you do now, which is very little. One of the finest things I know about Ben Franklin is the way he accepted that smarting rebuke. He was big enough and wise enough to realize that it was true to sense that he was headed for failure and social disaster. So he made a right about face. He began immediately to change his insolent, opinionated ways. I made it a rule, said Franklin, to forbear all direct contradiction to the sentiment of others and all positive assertion of my own. I even forbade myself the use of every word or expression in the language that imported a fixed opinion, such as certainly, undoubtedly, etc. And I adopted, instead of them, I conceive I apprehend or I imagine, a thing to be so or so, or it so appears to me at present. When another asserted something that I thought an error, I denied myself the pleasure of contradicting him abruptly and of showing immediately some absurdity in his proposition, and in answering I began by observing that in certain cases or circumstances his opinion would be right, but in the present case there appeared or seemed to me some difference, etc. I soon found the advantage of this change in my manner. The conversations I engaged in went on more pleasantly. The modest way in which I proposed my opinions procured them a readier reception and less contradiction. I had less mortification when I was found to be in the wrong, and I more easily prevailed with others to give up their mistakes and join with me when I happened to be in the right. And this mode, which I at first put on with some violence to natural inclination, became at length so easy and so habitual to me that perhaps for these fifty years past, no one has ever heard a dogmatical expression escape me. And to this habit, after my character of integrity, I think it principally owing that I had earned so much weight with my fellow citizens, when I proposed new institutions or alterations in the old, and so much influence in public councils when I became a member, for I was but a bad speaker, never eloquent, subject to much hesitation in my choice of words, hardly correct in language. And yet I generally carried my points. How do Ben Franklin's methods work in business? Let's take two examples. Catherine A. Allard of Kings Mountain, North Carolina, is an industrial engineering supervisor for a yarn processing plant. She told one of our classes how she handled a sensitive problem before and after taking our training. Part of my responsibility, she reported, deals with setting up and maintaining incentive systems and standards for our operators, so they can make more money by producing more yarn. The system we were using had worked fine when we had only two or three different types of yarn, but recently, we had expanded our inventory and capabilities to enable us to run more than 12 different varieties. 
The present system was no longer adequate to pay the operators fairly for the work being performed and give them an incentive to increase production. I had worked up a new system which would enable us to pay the operator by the class of yam she was running at any one particular time. With my new system in hand, I entered the meeting determined to prove to the management that my system was the right approach. I told them in detail how they were wrong and showed where they were being unfair and how I had all the answers they needed. To say the least, I failed miserably. I had become so busy defending my position on the new system that I had left them no opening to graciously admit their problems on the old one. The issue was dead. After several sessions of this course, I realized all too well where I had made my mistakes. I called another meeting, and this time I asked where they felt their problems were. We discussed each point, and I asked them their opinions on which was the best way to proceed. With a few low-keyed suggestions, at proper intervals, I let them develop my system themselves. At the end of the meeting when I actually presented my system, they enthusiastically accepted it. I am convinced now that nothing good is accomplished, and a lot of damage can be done. If you tell a person straight out that he or she is wrong, you only succeed in stripping that person of self-dignity and making yourself an unwelcome part of any discussion. Let's take another example and remember these cases I am citing are typical of the experiences of thousands of other people. R.V. Crowley was a salesman for a lumber company in New York. Crowley admitted that he had been telling hard-boiled lumber inspectors for years that they were wrong, and he had won the arguments too, but it hadn't done any good. For these lumber inspectors said Mr. Crowley, are like baseball umpires. Once they make a decision, they never change it. Mr. Crowley saw that his firm was losing thousands of dollars through the arguments he won. So while taking my course, he resolved to change tactics and abandon arguments. With what results? Here is the story as he told it to the fellow members of his class. One morning the phone rang in my office. A hot and bothered person at the other end proceeded to inform me that a car of lumber we had shipped into his plant was entirely unsatisfactory. His firm had stopped unloading and requested that we make immediate arrangements to remove the stock from their yard. After about one-fourth of the car had been unloaded, their lumber inspector reported that the lumber was running 55% below grade. Under the circumstances, they refused to accept it. I immediately started for his plant, and on the way turned over in my mind the best way to handle the situation. Ordinarily, under such circumstances, I should have quoted grading rules and tried, as a result of my own experience and knowledge as a lumber inspector, to convince the other inspector that the lumber was actually up to grade, and that he was misinterpreting the rules in his inspection. However, I thought I would apply the principles learned in this training. When I arrived at the plant, I found the purchasing agent and the lumber inspector in a wicked humor, both set for an argument and a fight. We walked out to the car that was being unloaded, and I requested that they continue to unload, so that I could see how things were going. I asked the inspector to go right ahead and lay out the rejects, as he had been doing, and to put the good pieces in another pile. After watching him for a while it began to dawn on me that his inspection actually was much too strict, and that he was misinterpreting the rules. This particular lumber was white pine, and I knew the inspector was thoroughly schooled in hard woods, but not a competent, experienced inspector on white pine. White Pine happened to be my own strong suit, but did I offer any objection to the way he was grading the lumber? None whatever. I kept on watching and gradually began to ask questions as to why certain pieces were not satisfactory. I didn't for one instant insinuate that the inspector was wrong. I emphasized that my only reason for asking was in order that we could give his firm exactly what they wanted in future shipments. By asking questions in a very friendly, cooperative spirit, and insisting continually that they were right in laying out boards not satisfactory to their purpose, I got him warmed up, and the strain relations between us began to thaw and melt away. An occasional carefully put remark on my part gave birth to the idea in his mind that possibly some of these rejected pieces were actually within the grade that they had bought and that their requirements demanded a more expensive grade. I was very careful, however, not to let him think I was making an issue of this point. 
Gradually his whole attitude changed. He finally admitted to me that he was not experienced on white pine and began to ask me questions about each piece. As it came out of the car, I would explain why such a piece came within the grade specified, but kept on insisting that we did not want him to take it if it was unsuitable for their purpose. He finally got to the point where he felt guilty every time he put a piece in the rejected pile, and at last he saw that the mistake was on their part for not having specified as good a grade as they needed. The ultimate outcome was that he went through the entire carload again after I left, accepted the whole lot, and we received a check in full. In that one instance alone, a little tact, and the determination to refrain from telling the other man he was wrong saved my company a substantial amount of cash, and it would be hard to place a money value on the goodwill that was saved. Martin Luther King was asked how, as a pacifist, he could be an admirer of Air Force General Daniel Chappie James, then the nation's highest-ranking black officer. Dr. King replied, I judge people by their own principles not by my own. In a similar way, General Robert E. Lee once spoke to the President of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, in the most glowing terms about a certain officer under his command. Another officer in attendance was astonished. General he said, do you not know that the man of whom you speak so highly is one of your bitterest enemies, who misses no opportunity to malign you? Yes, replied General Lee, but the President asked my opinion of him. He did not ask for his opinion of me. By the way, I am not revealing anything new in this chapter. Two thousand years ago, Jesus said, agree with thine adversary quickly, and two thousand two hundred years before Christ was born, King Aktoy of Egypt gave his son some shrewd advice advice that is sorely needed today. Be diplomatic counseled the king, it will help you gain your point. In other words, don't argue with your customer or your spouse or your adversary. Don't tell them they are wrong, don't get them stirred up. Use a little diplomacy. Principle 2. Show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say, you're wrong. 12. If you're wrong, admit it. This unspoiled woodland was called Forest Park and it was a forest probably not much different in appearance from what it was when Columbus discovered America. I frequently walked in this park with Rex, my little Boston bulldog. He was a friendly, harmless little hound, and since we rarely met anyone in the park, I took Rex along without a leash or a muzzle. What do you mean by letting that dog run loose in the park without a muzzle and leash? He reprimanded me. Don't you know it's against the law? You didn't think. You didn't think. The law doesn't give a tinker's damn about what you think. That dog might kill a squirrel or bite a child. Now, I'm going to let you off this time. But if I catch this dog out here again without a muzzle and a leash, you'll have to tell it to the judge. I meekly promised to obey. And I did obey for a few times. But Rex didn't like the muzzle, and neither did I. So we decided to take a chance. Everything was lovely for a while, and then we struck a snag. Rex and I raced over the brow of a hill one afternoon. And there, suddenly to my dismay I saw the majesty of the law astride a bay horse. Rex was out in front, heading straight for the officer. I was in for it. I knew it. So I didn't wait until the policeman started talking. I beat him to it. I said, Officer, you've caught me red-handed. I'm guilty. I have no alibis, no excuses. You warned me last week that if I brought the dog out here again without a muzzle, you would find me. Well, now the policeman responded in a soft tone. I know it's a temptation to let a little dog like that have a run out here when nobody is around. Sure it's a temptation I replied, but it is against the law. Well, a little dog like that isn't going to harm anybody, the policeman remonstrated. No, but he may kill squirrels I said. Well now, I think you are taking this a bit too seriously he told me. I'll tell you what you do. You just let him run over the hill there where I can't see him and we'll forget all about it. That policeman, being human, wanted a feeling of importance. So when I began to condemn myself, the only way he could nourish his self-esteem was to take the magnanimous attitude of showing mercy. But suppose I had tried to defend myself well. Did you ever argue with a policeman? But instead of breaking lances with him, I admitted that he was absolutely right and I was absolutely wrong. 
I admitted it quickly, openly, and with enthusiasm. The affair terminated graciously in my taking his side and his taking my side. Lord Chesterfield himself could hardly have been more gracious than this mounted policeman, who, only a week previously, had threatened to have the law on me. Yes, I know it is I replied softy, but I didn't think he would do any harm out here. If we know we are going to be rebuked anyhow, isn't it far better to beat the other person to it and do it ourselves? Isn't it much easier to listen to self-criticism than to bear condemnation from alien lips? Say about yourself all the derogatory things you know the other person is thinking or wants to say or intends to say and say them before that person has a chance to say them. The chances are a hundred to one that a generous, forgiving attitude will be taken and your mistakes will be minimized, just as the mounted policeman did with me and Rex. Ferdinand E. Warren, a commercial artist, used this technique to win the goodwill of a petulant, scolding buyer of art. It is important, in making drawings for advertising and publishing purposes, to be precise and very exact, Mr. Warren said as he told the story. Some art editors demand that their commissions be executed immediately, and, in these cases, some slight error is liable to occur. I knew one art director in particular, who was always delighted to find fault with some little thing. I have often left his office in disgust, not because of the criticism, but because of his method of attack. Recently I delivered a rush job to this editor, and he phoned me to call at his office immediately. He said something was wrong. When I arrived, I found just what I had anticipated and dreaded. He was hostile, gloating over his chance to criticize. He demanded with heat why I had done so and so. My opportunity had come to apply the self-criticism I had been studying about. So I said Mr. So and so, if what you say is true, I am at fault, and there is absolutely no excuse for my blunder. I have been doing drawings for you long enough to know better. I'm ashamed of myself. Immediately he started to defend me. Yes, you're right, but after all, this isn't a serious mistake. It is, only. I interrupted him. Any mistake I said, may be costly, and they are all irritating. He started to break in, but I wouldn't let him. I was having a grand time, for the first time in my life. I was criticizing myself and I loved it. I should have been more careful I continued. You give me a lot of work, and you deserve the best, so I'm going to do this drawing all over. No, no, he protested. I wouldn't think of putting you to all that trouble. He praised my work, assured me that he wanted only a minor change, and that my slight error hadn't cost his firm any money, and, after all, it was a mere detail not worth worrying about. My eagerness to criticize myself took all the fight out of him. He ended up by taking me to lunch, and before we parted, he gave me a check and another commission. Bruce Harvey of Albuquerque, New Mexico, had incorrectly authorized payment of full wages to an employee on sick leave. When he discovered his error, he brought it to the attention of the employee and explained that to correct the mistake, he would have to reduce his next paycheck by the entire amount of the overpayment. The employee pleaded that as that would cause him a serious financial problem, could the money be repaid over a period of time. In order to do this, Harvey explained, he would have to obtain his supervisor's approval. And this I knew reported Harvey, would result in a boss-type explosion. While trying to decide how to handle this situation better, I realized that the whole mess was my fault, and I would have to admit it to my boss. I walked into his office, told him that I had made a mistake, and then informed him of the complete facts. He replied in an explosive manner that it was the fault of the personnel department. I repeated that it was my fault. He exploded again about carelessness in the accounting department. Again I explained it was my fault. He blamed two other people in the office. Any fool can try to defend his or her mistakes and most fools do but it raises one above the herd and gives one a feeling of nobility and exultation to admit one's mistakes. For example, one of the most beautiful things that history records about Robert E. Lee is the way he blamed himself and only himself for the failure of Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Pickett's charge was undoubtedly the most brilliant and picturesque attack that ever occurred in the Western world. General George E. Pickett himself was picturesque. 
He wore his hair so long that his auburn locks almost touched his shoulders, and, like Napoleon in his Italian campaigns, he wrote ardent love letters almost daily while on the battlefield. His devoted troops cheered him that tragic July afternoon as he rode off jauntily toward the Union lines, his cap set at a rakish angle over his right ear, they cheered and they followed him, man touching man, rank pressing rank, with banners flying and bayonets gleaming in the sun, it was a gallant sight, daring, magnificent, a murmur of admiration ran through the Union lines as they beheld it, Pickett's troops swept forward at any easy trot through orchard and cornfield, across a meadow and over a ravine, all the time, the enemy's cannon was tearing ghastly holes in their ranks, but on they pressed, grim, irresistible, suddenly the Union infantry rose from behind the stone wall on Cemetery Ridge, where they had been hiding and fired volley after volley into Pickett's onrushing troops, the crest of the hill was a sheet of flame, a slaughterhouse, a blazing volcano, in a few minutes all of Pickett's brigade commanders except one were down, and four-fifths of his 5,000 men had fallen, General Louis A. Armistead, leading the troops in the final plunge, ran forward, vaulted over the stone wall, and, waving his cap on the top of his sword, shouted, give him the steel, boys, they did, they leaped over the wall, bayoneted their enemies, smashed skulls with clubbed muskets, and planted the battle flags of the south on Cemetery Ridge. The banners waved there only for a moment, but that moment, brief as it was, recorded the high watermark of the Confederacy. Pickett's charge brilliant, heroic was nevertheless the beginning of the end. Lee had failed. He could not penetrate the north, and he knew it. The south was doomed. Lee was so saddened, so shocked, that he sent in his resignation and asked Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy to appoint a younger and abler man. If Lee had wanted to blame the disastrous failure of Pickett's charge on someone else, he could have found a score of alibis. Some of his division commanders had failed him. The cavalry hadn't arrived in time to support the infantry attack. This had gone wrong and that had gone awry. But Lee was far too noble to blame others. As Pickett's beaten and bloody troops struggled back to the Confederate lines, Robert E. Lee rode out to meet them all alone and greeted them with a self-condemnation that was little short of sublime. All this has been my fault, he confessed. I and I alone have lost this battle. Few generals in all history have had the courage and character to admit that. Michael Chung, who teaches our course in Hong Kong, told of how the Chinese culture presents some special problems, and how sometimes it is necessary to recognize that the benefit of applying a principle may be more advantageous than maintaining an old tradition. He had one middle-aged class member who had been estranged from his son for many years. The father had been an opium addict but was now cured. In Chinese tradition an older person cannot take the first step. The father felt that it was up to his son to take the initiative toward a reconciliation. In an early session he told the class about the grandchildren he had never seen and how much he desired to be reunited with his son. His classmates, all Chinese, understood his conflict between his desire and long-established tradition. The father felt that young people should have respect for their elders, and that he was right in not giving in to his desire, but to wait for his son to come to him. Toward the end of the course the father again addressed his class. I have pondered this problem, he said. Dale Carnegie says, if you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. It is too late for me to admit it quickly but I can admit it emphatically. I wronged my son. He was right in not wanting to see me and to expel me from his life. I may lose face by asking a younger person's forgiveness, but I was at fault, and it is my responsibility to admit this. The class applauded and gave him their full support. At the next class he told how he went to his son's house, asked for and received forgiveness and was now embarked on a new relationship with his son, his daughter-in-law, and the grandchildren he had at last met. Albert Hubbard was one of the most original authors who ever stirred up a nation, and his stinging sentences often aroused fierce resentment. But Hubbard with his rare skill for handling people, frequently turned his enemies into friends. For example, when some irritated reader wrote in to say that he didn't agree with such and such an article and ended by calling Hubbard this and that, Albert Hubbard would answer like this. Come to think it over, 
I don't entirely agree with it myself, not everything I wrote yesterday appeals to me today. I am glad to learn what you think on the subject. The next time you are in the neighborhood you must visit us, and we'll get this subject threshed out for all time. So here is a hand clasp over the miles, and I am. Yours sincerely. Albert Hubbard. What could you say to a man who treated you like that? When we are right, let's try to win people gently and tactfully to our way of thinking. And when we are wrong and that will be surprisingly often. If we are honest with ourselves let's admit our mistakes quickly and with enthusiasm. Not only will that technique produce astonishing results, but, believe it or not, it is a lot more fun, under the circumstances, than trying to defend oneself. Remember the old proverb, by fighting you never get enough, but by yielding you get more than you expected. Principle 3. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. 13. A drop of honey. If your temper is aroused and you tell him a thing or two, you will have a fine time unloading your feelings. But what about the other person? Will he share your pleasure? Will your belligerent tones, your hostile attitude, make it easy for him to agree with you? If you come at me with your fists, doubled said Woodrow Wilson, I think I can promise you that mine will double as fast as yours, but if you come to me and say, let us sit down and take counsel together, and, if we differ from each other, understand why it is that we differ, just what the points at issue are we will presently find that we are not so far apart after all, that the points on which we differ are few, and the points on which we agree are many, and that if we only have the patience and the candor and the desire to get together, we will get together. Nobody appreciated the truth of Woodrow Wilson's statement more than John D. Rockefeller Jr. back in 1915, when Rockefeller was the most fiercely despised man in Colorado, one of the bloodiest strikes in the history of American industry had been shocking the state for two terrible years. Irate, belligerent miners were demanding higher wages from the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. Rockefeller controlled that company. Property had been destroyed, troops had been called out, blood had been shed, strikers had been shot, their bodies riddled with bullets. At a time like that, with the air seething with hatred, Rockefeller wanted to win the strikers to his way of thinking. And he did it. How? Here's the story. After weeks spent in making friends, Rockefeller addressed the representatives of the strikers. This speech, in its entirety, is a masterpiece. It produced astonishing results. The opening of that remarkable speech follows. Note how it fairly glows with friendliness. Rockefeller, remember, was talking to men who, a few days previously, had wanted to hang him by the neck to a sour apple tree. Yet he couldn't have been more gracious, more friendly, if he had addressed a group of medical missionaries. His speech was radiant with such phrases as I am proud to be here, having visited in your homes, met many of your wives and children we meet here not as strangers, but as friends, spirit of mutual friendship, our common interests, it is only by your courtesy that I am here, etc. Had this meeting been held two weeks ago, I should have stood here a stranger to most of you, recognizing a few faces. Having had the opportunity last week of visiting all the camps in the southern coal field, and of talking individually with practically all of the representatives, except those who were away, having visited in your homes, met many of your wives and children, we meet here not as strangers, but as friends, and it is in that spirit of mutual friendship that I am glad to have this opportunity to discuss with you our common interests. Since this is a meeting of the officers of the company and the representatives of the employees, it is only by your courtesy that I am here, for I am not so fortunate as to be either one or the other, and yet I feel that I am intimately associated with you men, for, in a sense, I represent both the stockholders and the directors. Isn't that a superb example of the fine art of making friends out of enemies? Suppose Rockefeller had taken a different tack. Suppose he had argued with those miners and hurled devastating facts in their faces. Suppose he had told them by his tones and insinuations that they were wrong. Suppose that, by all the rules of logic, 
he had proved that they were wrong. What would have happened? More anger would have been stirred up, more hatred, more revolt. Lincoln said that, in effect, over a hundred years ago. Here are his words. It is an old and true maxim that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. So with men, if you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. Therein is a drop of honey that catches his heart, which, say what you will, is the great high road to his reason, business executives have learned that it pays to be friendly to strikers. For example, when 2,500 employees in the White Motor Company's plant struck for higher wages and a union shop, Robert F. Black, then president of the company, didn't lose his temper and condemn and threaten and talk of tyranny and communists. He actually praised the strikers. He published an advertisement in the Cleveland papers complimenting them on the peaceful way in which they laid down their tools. Finding the strike pickets idle, he bought them a couple of dozen baseball bats and gloves and invited them to play ball on vacant lots. For those who preferred bowling, he rented a bowling alley. This friendliness on Mr. Black's part did what friendliness always does, it begot friendliness, so the strikers borrowed brooms, shovels, and rubbish carts, and began picking up matches, papers, cigarette stubs, and cigar butts around the factory. Imagine it. Imagine strikers tidying up the factory grounds while battling for higher wages and recognition of the union. Such an event had never been heard of before in the long, tempestuous history of American labor wars. That strike ended with a compromise settlement within a week ended without any ill-feeling or rancor.